Farmer Tom here. Welcome to the Farmer Tom Cast. And today on our ongoing series, Heroes of the Green, we have Dr. Dominic Corva. Hey, Dominic, how's it going? It's going good, Farmer Tom. Good to, good to talk to you. It's been quite a while. Yeah, it has, buddy. You want to tell the world your story? I'll hand the mic over to you. Uh, where to begin with this has been kind of a, a, a question that I've had. Uh, let me just start by saying where I am now, and then I'm going to go back and trace the path that, that led me here. Right now, I am the Cannabis Studies Program Director at Cal Poly Humboldt uh, University in California, Arcata, California. Uh, this is the, I'm the program director of an undergraduate degree program in cannabis studies with two concentrations, environmental stewardship and equity and social justice. And it's the first liberal arts undergraduate degree cannabis studies uh, program of its kind. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on across the country, and a lot of them are oriented towards you know, industry training or the specifics of the law, a lot of really good stuff, a lot of medicinal plant chemistry programs, a lot of, a lot of really great, you know, developments uh, across the education landscape. But this one's, this one's a little unique uh, in that it's, you know, it grounds all of our students in the, you know, history and culture and geography of the plant. And then also, you know, how we've related to it over time. Uh, and, you know, the goal is to really be able to have students be able to graduate with, you know, applied tools to, to work in the public or private sector around cannabis or other issues, but broadly in the interest of, you know, stewardship, you know, environmental stewardship, community stewardship. So it's an applied critical studies program. And, uh, you know, part of this is that I'm, you know, the hire was a, a hire in sociology. I'm trained as a geographer and we'll, we'll, we'll go back from there. So we'll, we'll start to me being a geographer. Um, back in the 2000s when I was in graduate school at the University of Washington, Seattle. It should be noted that the year after I got there, Dr. Sunil Agarwal also got there. He wasn't a doctor yet. Neither of us were. We were in the geography program. Uh, he was taking a break from his MD to do his PhD. And uh, I was going from, you know, the master's to the PhD track. And I had a, a broader interest in, you know, a critical analysis of the drug war, especially around its globalization uh, and the, 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 the role played by the U.S. government in attempting to globalize this, uh, especially in Latin America. And the blowback that resulted from that and, and so forth. But uh, at the same time, I was, you know, taking classes and, and, and teaching and, you know, working with, you know, brilliant people like Sunil. Uh, and Sunil was was working in Seattle on uh, medical cannabis from seed to sale. And Sunil and I were smoking buddies, right? Uh, there weren't a ton of them in our grad program, but uh, both of us had a, a positive and constructive relationship with the plant. And we had a few other folks with us as well. So, but we were both, you know, intersecting in that we were formally researching the stuff, right? Like the, the broader questions of drug prohibition for me in the Americas and medical cannabis, uh, really a highly localized focus, you know, uh, ethnographic supply chain from seed to patient consumption. And so I was learning from Sunil really a lot about, you know, the, the cultural geography approach that he was developing in his studies uh, and, and this grassroots focus, you know, uh, there in Seattle, uh, even while I was, you know, uh, studying social movements in Bolivia. And so we, we got to talk a lot. And I had taught two courses in a row called Globalization and the War on Drugs. And, and the Law Societies and Justice Program said, these have gone great, but like you've taught, you know, two the same in a row. So can you come up with something else, you know? And uh, I'm, I'm sure it must have been probably the, you know, the day after a particularly awesome conversation with Sunil, uh, because after, a, 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 you know, maybe about five minutes where I was like, oh man, I got to invent a new class. I, I remember exactly. I was driving down, you know, University Avenue and thinking about it. And then it hit me. And I was like, I was just inspired by, I think some, some things that Sunil had inspired me to think about locally. And he had kind of drawn me into some of the other, like the King County Bar Association drug policy project. So I was involved a little bit because of him in some of the stuff going on in Seattle uh, around cannabis reform. And I was like, okay, wait, what's the class that I will just l would love to teach? And, and I said, Reefer Madness. I want to teach a class called Reefer Madness, Cannabis and Criminalization in the U.S. So to kind of turn 
some of my, you know, methodological and critical tools from far away to my backyard, right? Uh, and 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 I knew I had Sunil in my pocket, and 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 he would be a great assistance for this. And I was like, I'm just going to propose this. I'm not sure. This was like 2005, 2006. It was, you know, Steve Herbert was like, that sounds great. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Uh, so at that point, I became, you know, uh, more formally, academically, you know, part of the broader cannabis, you know, reform movement. Whereas before I had been, you know, a, a consumer. And, you know, as I, I think I had begun to learn then, you know, uh, I had been a patient all along that that cannabis was something more than recreation to me and that it, uh, you know, had helped me along the way in a, a number of different different ways, uh, dealing with especially, you know, past trauma. So I, you know, put my head together with Sunil and, and we thought about it and came up with a, a broad class design that was, well, the first half of this should be just kind of like the history, the social history of cannabis, right? You know, not get too deep, whatever. It's just like, you know, culturally, where does it come from? You know, where did prohibition come from? What were the politics around that? How did that change over time? What was the significance of medical cannabis in the 1990s, the, the HIV AIDS crisis and how that really, uh, you know, brought cannabis back in terms of, uh, you know, uh, political reform because it had died in the 19, at the end of the 1970s and really had, uh, you know, under Reagan uh, suffered. So, you know, we had all these sort of social justice issues and political economy issues. And we were particularly guided, I was particularly guided uh, by um, the notion that I could just use Martin Lee's book, Smoke Signals, as, as the kind of the textbook for the first half of it. And we could do some more things. And I, I brought in some more kind of academic work, but there wasn't that much at that time, uh, to be honest. Uh, as, as a subject of formal study, you know, a lot of the literatures around cannabis were just literatures around drug prohibition more broadly and not really focused so much. There was, you know, a, a book by um, Wendy Chapkis about Valerie Corral. And you should have Valerie Corral on your show as well, Tom. Uh, and WAM, the Women's Alliance for Medical Marijuana in Santa Cruz. And Wendy Chapkis is my friend today and a sociologist. And like her her book, Dying to Get High, was eye-opening for me. So there were, there were kind of these key texts. And then, you know, I think there was a, a documentary that was uh, pretty good, you know, that kind of covered the, you know, the history of cannabis and, and its prohibition and to this day, I think, you know, remains a really great uh piece for just kind of communicating historically, like how there were different periods of, you know, moral panic around cannabis. And they all kind of connected over time. And they all did something a little different, but kind of added to the framework that, that brought us to the challenges we had today. And so for the second half, and this is where Sunil was particularly important, guest speakers. We had a, a real powerhouse, you know, succession of guest speakers that uh, included our friend, you know, Vivian McPeak, uh, the founder of Hempfest. Allison Holcomb, long before she did our uh, our initiative, which you know I have uh, mixed feelings about in in general about what happened with that and so forth. But uh, you know Allison was you know eight and a half months pregnant, powerhouse woman, amazing speaker, uh, and we had Douglas Hyatt, you know almost her her <laughs> counterpart later on, you know um, in terms of little antagonism. Um, Roger Goodman, uh, before he became a state senator, you know, he was a uh, King County Bar Association Drug Policy Project uh, leader as a lawyer. Gosh, the the, the list went on. I, I, I forgive, I ask forgiveness of the people I'm, I'm, they're not immediately popping in mind right now, but Sunil as well, Greg Gerdeman, uh, you know, folks that didn't, you know, fade away, you know, like they were just getting going. And, um, you know, at the end of the class, things had gone really well, you know, like that was pretty clear. Uh, uh, and I ended up getting a, you know, an award from the, the Dean for, you know, that class in terms of its, its outcomes, one of the highest rated at the university that year, but it was a, you know, it was a collaboration and, uh, you know, that, that award was really to me less of a validation of me and, and more of a validation that like, this is a path that I can go down. That's different from what I thought I was going to be doing on, you know, Latin America and, and, and the war on drugs to like, you know, something a little closer to home, you know, like, uh, which, which felt better to me um, because I felt like I could make more of a difference and be more present um, with the subject and, and have it matter for the people that I was, you know, studying and, and, and working with. 
uh, rather than feeling a, a little bit like a you know academic tourist, you know, by oh, I'm going to go to Bolivia and get a dissertation out of it. Uh, although you know, I cared very deeply about the struggle there. Like, they just was never going to be the kind of you know home team, you know, power uh, that could be built there. And so, uh, the the thing I think that really sealed that class was at the end of it, at the very end of it. Um, I said, there's kind of an elephant in the room and, you know, we've gone this class, the whole class talking about other people and their experiences with cannabis and all this other stuff. And we've never talked to each other about our own. Right. Um, and I said, this is not required, you know, like uh, if nobody wants to do it, that's okay. And I would understand why, uh, but uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go outside for 10 minutes and you guys think about it. You talk about it. Uh, and when I come back, I'm going to, kind of tell you my story, my critical reflection on my own path with cannabis. And I went outside and, and when I came back in, man, it was like church. Like it was like the, the vibe that I had never felt before. There was just this powerful feeling. And, uh, you know, uh, I got up and, and, and said, you know, talked about, about my personal path, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, and I said, now, you know, it's a you know, totally optional and one by one, you know, like pretty much everyone, everyone in the class raised their hands and, and had a really amazing, you know, insightful reflection that they couldn't have had at the beginning of the class. And I couldn't have either uh, on my own end. And, and at that point I was like, this isn't just, you know, the replacement class for the other thing. I think this might be the direction I'm going to, going to really want to go going forward. And so uh, you know, there were still a couple years left on my academic PhD journey. Uh, you know, I, I still had to finish my dissertation on, on Bolivia and that took a little longer than I'd hoped, but, um, uh, I was also, you know, teaching at Sarah Lawrence college in New York as well for a li little bit there, right at the end of my PhD and, and, and just after I finished. And that gave me, a, um, a certain amount of freedom that, uh, um, other folks who were, you know, stringing together as many adjunct classes as they could at, you know, various public universities didn't have at that moment. I, what, I, what wasn't happening was I wasn't getting a job. You know, it was a financial crisis. My discipline, there was no job openings. And the ones that were there were in places where I was like, that's not where I want to be. Uh, and so, but but I did have, a, a you know, this position with this uh, liberal arts college, Sarah Lawrence College, which is just one of those real kind of small classes you know like the syllabus is like a vague plan let's see what happens and really it's just about the personal relationships with the small classes and the students and getting to meet with them about their projects and you know after the first year where it was doing basically latin american politics they were like okay what else do you want to teach and i'm like well cannabis and, and so i you know began to do iterations um, of that and uh, i was super blessed because I didn't have to pay rent in New York City because I had a, a, a great granduncle who I'd never been in contact with who, who had a condo that he wasn't using and he let me use it. And so uh, I was able to save up money while I was teaching and then like take a semester off uh, and then, you know, pick when I was teaching and what I was teaching for, for a few years there. Uh, and what I did was, you know, my, my ex D and our cat were in, in Seattle still. And so that was still kind of the, the home base, but I was able to start going to Humboldt, um, California, where I am now, uh, because I knew that if I wanted to, you know, look at the, you know, how social movements, you know, turned into, you know, cannabis cultivation in the United States, social, social movements from the 1960s and, you know, people with the, this, you know, notion that, that the world could be a better, you know, better than it is. And, uh, you know, had used their freedom and money that, that, that they had because of the cannabis, you know, uh, markets that, that they had developed kind of accidentally, uh, to do all sorts of, you know, amazing environmental activism and community institution building and all that stuff. And I, I knew, knew it was here. And so I came here and I began to, you know, meet, especially some of the old timers, you know, the, the people who were veterans of the, uh, free speech movement, the civil rights movement, the you know anti-Vietnam War movement, um, the anti-war movement, uh, the you know 
just uh, the broader explosion of anti-systemic movements that were happening in the 1960s, not just in the United States, but all around the world, right? Uh, and they had decided, you know, at the end of the 1960s, after getting gassed by helicopters and having Ronald Reagan really, you know, <laughs> come after them, that, uh, you know, they would they wanted to go to the countryside. They couldn't stay in the city and fight 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 the system in the city. They needed to kind of learn how to uh, construct something, you know, uh, positive and not just not just, you know, be critical of what was, but to be you know creative and generative of what could be. Right. I arrived there around 2009, 2010. And like I said, between, you know, for, for a few years there, 2009 to 2012 ish in particular, I would spend a, you know, a few months here, a few months in Washington, a few months in New York and repeat. It was a, an amazing experience. Um, I didn't necessarily even know what was going to happen with that. But this, this was exactly at the time in Southern Humboldt when for the first time those, those Southern Humboldt community watersheds were beginning to organize because they knew that like, you know, things were changing. You know, 2010 was the legalization initiative in California. Uh, but more dire to them, even though this raised the, you know, the, 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 the thought of it was the rapid falling prices for their product. Right. Uh, and that, you know, change was on the horizon and many of them for decades had said the price of cannabis is, you know, like we're not going to, this is not going to happen forever. You know, like this is a windfall and we should make the most of it while we can. Uh, and, you know, when they began, they thought it would be just a couple of years, you know, at the end of the seventies, they thought, you know, cannabis was going to be legal soon. Uh, but prohibition had of course provided the price support that lasted decades instead. And so, uh, you know, at this moment, they came together at the Mateo community center and meeting, meeting called what's after pot. And they're like, what do we do? You know, like the price has gone from $4,000 a pound to 3,000 to 2,000 in a couple of years. And like, if it gets down to $500 a pound, like it's the end, right? I just want to note right now, Farmer Tom, those prices were about $300 a pound uh, in, in Southern Humboldt. So what they were afraid of, it took a while to completely happen. Um, there was, there was, some ups and downs that happened, uh, you know, in, in in the next decade. But everything that they started, you know, trying to organize to to deal with uh, happened. The history of that is one which I was in, invited to to be there for the things that they tried to do. Uh, and there were different groups doing different things. Um, there was the younger generation. There were, you know, the the green rushers as well. Many of whom, you know, at that point were hardly distinguishable necessarily from the other cannabis people. Um, we kind of changed rapidly and especially with the onset of legalization, but um, uh, there was a, uh, an ordinance, you know, organization uh, push in the county called CCVH, uh, which was somewhat controversial. Uh, it was pretty, pretty big tent, but in particular it was oriented toward people who were going to like, you know, like give money and do things now. Uh, there, there was not much, there was a sense of urgency and they weren't going to wait around for the old hippies to, you know, weigh in and, and convince them. Uh, but what they did do is really kickstart the county apparatus because up until that point, you know, the growers didn't, they, you know, when it came to the county, they, they fought the county for the most part, right? Uh, there were specific things, you know, where like they helped elect a, you know, progressive, you know, DA, Paul Gallegos that like, you know, had the, you know, sort of hands-off approach. Um, but, you know, the county had always been the enemy and now the county had to be the partner, right? Uh, because legalization was coming and basically, you know, how are we going to survive this, right? Uh, you know, how are we, how are we going to be taxed? And that was a big, you know, pitch to the county. It's like, you're going to want our money. And, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, the county was like, yes, yes, we want your money. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I was, I was invited in, to the room on on you know that process uh uh over time and so i was there for you know uh gavin newsom's blue ribbon commission tour uh and the board of equalization tour um 2014 2015 2016. uh i got to just kind of like be there while these things were happening but as you know of course i'm skipping something over which is in 2013 
which is, you know, I'm still doing all that stuff in California, but like it's May, 2013. I'm finished my semester with at Sarah Lawrence college again. And Washington state had just, you know, passed the initiative in 2012. Right. Mm -hmm.